Welcome to Brain Scratch. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with me here today. A few quick things before we get to today's topic. I will be taking next week off, but you can still find new content if you need some John time. The second Crime After Crime anniversary special is coming on September 1st and features many true crime hosts joining Danielle Hallen and myself as we determine the winner of season two and discuss Florida woman stories. You can find that on your favorite podcatchers or the Crime After Crime YouTube channel. Also, a new episode of Yellow Tape will be recorded live on Sunday night at 8 p.m. Eastern on this channel, which you'll be able to watch anytime the following week or month or whenever on replay. And it will also feature several true crime hosts, including Tim and Lance from Crawl Space, Chris Duet from Criminal Perspective, and Sarah Turney, raising money for private investigations for The Missing. That brings me to my next quick update, and that's about the case of missing person Alyssa Turney. If you're not familiar with it, this is a case we covered when Brain Scratch was just getting started and was one of the first times a family member, her sister Sarah, reached out and asked for help. Sarah Turney had been searching for justice for her sister practically her whole life. There was always a strong suspicion that Michael Turney, Sarah's father and Alyssa's stepfather, was responsible for Alyssa's disappearance. Sarah has worked with numerous true crimers, sharing her story over the years, starting her own podcast eventually, and recently she even went viral on TikTok. Last year, we finally got to meet each other in person at CrimeCon, and she's been on the channel here several times. I'm really happy to announce that after nearly 20 years, Michael Turney has finally been indicted by a grand jury He's been arrested and he's been charged with second degree homicide. We still don't know where Alyssa's remains are. This case is being processed as a no body homicide, but I'm really hopeful that Sarah will find those answers and justice in this process. Before his arrest was announced, we had already scheduled Sarah for Yellow Tape Live this Sunday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, and she's telling me that she's still going to be there. So please feel free to stop by and share your support directly with her. She still has a lot to go through with all this and needs all the support that we can give her. On to today's topic. I know the country has been facing some serious challenges, and over the past week, it's kind of raised up again. It seems that we've once again hit a boiling point here in Minnesota. And it's actually been taking me back to a high school memory that I wanted to share with all of you and see if somehow we can parallel some of that information into what we're going through here. Now, before I start, I just wanna be clear that I'm just trying to understand things. I don't want anyone to get the impression that I have anything figured out in today's video because I'm telling you right now, I don't. One thing I always focused on in my previous job as a business analyst was knowing what questions to ask. With the right questions, you can get to the heart of the matter and hopefully figure out solutions. I totally understand why people protest and I've actually participated in several in my life, but why do people riot? And have I ever been in one? That's what we're talking about on today's episode of Brain Scratch. This week, Minnesotans were met with another protest turned riot in Minneapolis. If you happen to miss the details, according to the press, a homicide suspect that was being tracked down by police ended his own life when they were zeroing in on him. Of course, that's a story that many of us that follow true crime have heard before, but a question was raised of did this African-American man actually end his own life or was there some police involvement? According to the media, in a very short time of not having proof that he actually ended his own life, people once again took to the streets. Now, in the majority of coverage I'm finding about this case, there's very little talk of a peaceful protest occurring at all. It's almost as if things went from zero to riot. But after digging through many articles and into social media accounts, I am seeing that it started as a moderately sized peaceful protest. To try to bring the protest to arrest, police actually released the footage from city cameras about 90 minutes after the occurrence. And 
it does seem pretty clear from the footage that the original story was true. You literally see this man end his own life without any direct police contact. This was even announced at the protest and blasted all over social media, but it seems it was too late. While the Star Tribune reports that most of the protesters actually remained peaceful, packs of looters broke off and went into the streets, and Minneapolis had another night of curfew, National Guard deployment, and rioting. Of course, back in school, we all learned a romanticized tale of what essentially was a looting and riot that helped start this country that we call the Boston Tea Party. But I learned what a riot really looked like in 1992. I was a junior in high school and living in an unincorporated suburb of Oxnard called El Rio. Teachers were trying to help us understand what was happening in downtown Los Angeles as we were stuck to television screens at home every night watching people destroying businesses, stealing from them, attacking each other, and even pulling a truck driver out of his vehicle to beat him within an inch of his life. Of course, all this was in response to four police officers being acquitted for use of excessive force against an African-American man named Rodney King. They were acquitted despite the fact that it was caught on videotape for the world to judge for themselves, and Los Angeles was literally and figuratively set ablaze. As I drove through areas of South Los Angeles up to 10 years after the riots, I could still see the scars it left. Businesses that remained closed, walls still scorched, waiting for new owners brave enough to try to make it work again. When I think back to all that, I feel like I've got the blueprints for what I'm going to see in the future of Minnesota over the next several years. I'm still very worried about what we're going to see when the trial of the four officers involved in the George Floyd incident concludes. But there was an emotional component to witnessing that riot back in 92 as well. Impressionable high school students that watched what happened seemed to learn from it. A small high school called Rio Mesa that sat in the middle of strawberry fields would have its own little riot in 1993. I remember hearing the chatter. A demonstration was being planned. Several of the more popular kids that were not quite clean enough to join the associated student body, but popular enough to motivate many students, started dishing out the details. It was originally planned to be a mass walkout. Our campus did have a few security guards and we were locked in during school hours by a gate that surrounded the campus and campus parking lot, but somehow students were able to get copies of the keys to unlock these gates. I heard they had friends that worked at the locksmith company that made the keys for the school, but of course I can't confirm that. The security guards were unarmed and typically served as little more than the butt of several jokes by students. I was one of the regulars in the school's video productions class and would often be given special access by my teacher to leave certain other classes so that I could cover special events for the school video news program, the Spartan Spotlight. I knew what was coming up and when it was going to happen, so I grabbed a video camera before the walkout. Then it happened, 9 a.m. 150 students walk out all at the same time, but it was sort of awkward. The students headed to the administration office, but were kicked out of it. So all of a sudden you had students just all crowding around the open areas, almost like it was a lunch period. There was no real speeches or grandstanding that I remember. And despite the response, it seemed like there was actually pretty little organization. The students that didn't participate in the walkout originally were now filtering out of their classes and joining the group. The energy amongst the crowd was completely unfocused, but you could actually feel the charge and the desperation in it. I somehow was able to stay focused on my task at hand, documenting what was happening instead of becoming a part of it. Smaller packs started grouping together and roaming the school. Then I heard a window break. Instead of watching a riot on my TV like I did in 92, this time I was watching it through a viewfinder and standing right in the middle of it. Students breaking more classroom windows, kicking doors, roaming the campus in larger and larger destructive packs, 
fights breaking out, obscenities and objects being hurled in the direction of administrators. I remember filming an assistant principal nervously quick-stepping it back to the office, trying to act like he wasn't hearing all the comments and names being shouted behind him. Eventually, those perimeter gates were magically opened and vehicles were being stopped on the road in the front of the school, with several students even overtaking a cement mixer. Soon after, riot gear and a line of deputies from the sheriff's office showed up as a helicopter flew overhead demanding that we all go back to class. Two riot lines were set up and started clearing the campus, arresting several students. Parents were flooding into the office, trying to pull their students out of school as the news of what was happening spread. It was certainly the most chaotic event I had ever been in up to that point. It would be reported on by all local media and even the LA Times, almost like some strange boomerang of negative energy returning to the location that it originated from. Some of the details were certainly cleaned up in the media, no mention of the more violent acts or even the cement mixer. The harshest thing reported by the LA Times was that a teacher was shoved and a student was being considered for expulsion. But I remember what I saw, and I know a tape of it existed at some point. However, that riot wasn't about injustice or inequality. It was over a new tardy policy. I'm not joking. Under the new rules, students who were late to class twice received one hour of detention after school. On the sixth infraction, they'd have to attend Saturday school. On the eighth, they would be suspended for a day. And on the 10th, they were dropped completely from the class. When I hear about it now, it sounds a little tough, but not necessarily completely overbearing. Up to that point, teachers had their own policies and frankly, Some of them didn't really enforce showing up on time at all. Others that were heavier handed were kind of abused in different ways. I remember one particular class where we would all wait outside the door and run in together as the bell was ringing just to agitate the teacher. One day, right before the bell rang, our teacher stuck her head out to see if we were all out there waiting. And then she closed and locked the doors right before the bell rang. Campus security took us all up to the office to get our tardy slips written up, and of course, we all complained about the doors being locked before the actual bell. Looking back on it, we were obviously testing a boundary and needed to learn a thing or two about the price for doing that. Everything has a cost. When things settled down again, one particular student decided to make a little cash and created Rio Mesa Riot t-shirts with a big depiction of the event, including the students jumping on the cement mixer drawn on the back. I understand he sold every single one that was made, and occasionally you'd see students brave enough to wear them later in the school year actually on campus. But when I think back on that, the original message the students were trying to send was never lost. The act of walking out of class in that way was meant to show that their system had a serious flaw. If they needed to write up tardy slips for all of us, the office would be flooded for hours. That's why the group headed there together. None of the media publications missed the message the students were sending. Even if you disagreed with their stance, you knew exactly what it was. What we saw in Minneapolis this week reminds me of my high school memories. Some of the footage took me right back to it as I see very young people flooding in and out of stores, running around like they don't even understand what they're really doing there. Some of them were obviously stealing, others were just knocking stuff over and breaking fixtures and merchandise. The strong message that we're seeing in the media is basically saying that these rioters weren't even smart enough to know that their cause was incorrect because the guy ended his own life. Dr. Ken Eisold wrote on psychologytoday.com way back in 2011 that, quote, it usually takes an incident to get a riot started, such as an accident or the police attacking or killing an innocent bystander. But once it has begun, a raging mob has a life of its own. Deep-seated resentments, repetitive frustrations, and long-standing disappointments galvanize people into action, and the mob provides cover and anonymity that makes it easier to overcome one's moral scruples. One is immersed, engulfed, 
and it can become an exuberant experience, a joyful release for long suppressed emotions. It can also become manic driven, a means of re restlessly seeking new outlets. So maybe this riot isn't a message in itself, but an extension of the protests and riots that came before it. This makes me wonder if some of those looters either watched and are mimicking this behavior, like so many of my fellow classmates appeared to do back in 1993, or perhaps there were people there who had looted before. Maybe the feeling of control that you get from destroying and taking is so short-lived that it festers in people and helps entice them to find opportunities to do it again. Even realizing it's extremely fleeting, it's still better than no sense of control at all. I think losing your sense of control over your life is a feeling that a lot of us can associate with, in particular this year, and maybe there's a common ground there to start building some better communication. The following morning, it seemed that all was once again calm in Minneapolis, but the signs of what happened the night before are apparent. 33 people were arrested, broken glass litters the streets, and fire crews were sent to four locations overnight. The police have also taken down their video of the suspect. However, it seems there are many copies floating around online. I strongly urge you to be cautious if you research this, as the footage is very, very shocking. There's also footage of an officer being struck in the back of the head by an object that has been thrown by a protester. That's pretty disturbing. Actually, I don't even feel right saying it's a protester. I don't know if it's a protester, a looter, or a rioter. And I, th I think we certainly should start making some distinctions around that. I'm seeing reports that the officer was actually in a hospital and it was not a life-threatening injury. Dr. Isold also states that riots can be appeals to be heard when normal channels don't work. They can be eruptions of rage when frustrations boil over. They can be expressions of hope that things could change. And they could be all these things and more. I think I have one question that I actually can ask and answer. Is the next generation watching and being influenced by what we're doing? That's certainly what happened at a little high school in the middle of some strawberry fields back in 1993. And I'm certain these issues are much more important than a school tardy policy. You know, I think there's a lot to learn when you look at events like this, but you really have to kind of be willing to uh, open up your mind to looking at it from different angles. And that's why I thought it was so important to try to find the right questions um, for why, why do protesters turn to rioting? Why do they turn to looting? Uh, I've seen a lot of experts that are talking about the fact that it has to do with that loss of control. It has to do with a feeling of your voice not being heard. And I think that's fairly easy to understand. And I think that's what I struggled with so much um, with this week's occurrence and why when I originally looked at it because of the way the press was coming through, it was like, you know, you're basically trying to tell me that all this happened because of a mistake that, because you know, this group just completely misunderstood the situation and they went out and just busted up the town. And it's for me, it's much more complex than that. Um, and I know that it is for many other people. As I looked into more and more articles and saw comments from uh, even from some of the government officials in this case, they understand that it was about so much more than that. And it's pretty interesting to hear some of them even say, like, look, this isn't a time for us to try to lay blame. This is a time for us to try to figure out these conversations, to try to figure out the next steps, to try to address these overarching issues. Um, and that's why I think it is so important to really drill into the right questions, the right conversation to create the platform for those things to happen. And I still don't know what that is, but I still feel like I'm not seeing it. I still feel like I'm seeing pockets of conversations and every now and then these pockets bump into each other and then we get occurrences uh, like this. And it just, it you know, it's really made me think about some of the stuff that I've done in my life. And there was just something about that footage. Like I was watching this footage of, I felt like some of them were high school kids that were literally running through, you know, the, the target in downtown Minneapolis and just busting stuff up. And it just took me right back to, you know, I've seen this before. 
Um, quite honestly, I haven't really thought about the Rio Mesa riot uh, in a very, very long time. Um, and it was weird to have everything just kind of start flooding back in terms of details. I was also surprised to find that the LA Times still had two articles written uh, and posted about it. But as I kind of told you guys, I was also surprised to see that those articles were pretty well scrubbed. Not a whole lot of what was actually going on there. We had kind of rival gangs. Um, the school that we were at was essentially uh, like almost on a borderline for two rival gangs and then a kind of more affluent community from Camarillo, kids that weren't going to Camarillo High School. They kind of drew a line out there where some of them would be trucked in to uh, Rio Mesa. So it was kind of a unique mix there in particular. And once things started really kind of going off the rails, um, there was a lot of violence that was happening between students. I was literally watching it uh, happen all around me. Um, and none of that, of course, was was reported at all. But um, I don't know. Uh, there's a lot to think about, a lot to discuss here. And uh, I hope that we can open up the forum. I'm going to leave the comments open. Uh, as always, I ask that we remain respectful to each other and each other's opinions. I think that is such a major component to make in any headway on conversations like this. Uh, I know that they're emotionally charged. I know that um, when I first heard about what happened in town last night, uh, my first thing was a complete emotional reaction. And I've kind of had to look into more information to learn more about what was actually happening and absorb all that so I could get to the point of even firing up this camera and talking to you guys. Uh, honestly, I started writing this out and I wasn't even sure if I was going to do anything with it. I was just having these feelings. I knew I couldn't concentrate on a case right now because I was being so pulled about what happened last night. Um, but I wasn't sure if I was even going to film it or put it out there. But ultimately, I um, I feel like it is a conversation worth having. And I know that you are, um, you're a bunch of good self thinkers out there. I know that you guys are able to analyze this stuff for yourself. So I kind of wanted to put it out there and I'm really curious to see what you have, uh, in terms of feedback, in terms of trying to understand this better. Maybe you are able to identify some of those questions and I'm kind of looking for, um, as I was putting this together, I was really trying to find I mean, ultimately, for me, it boiled down to why do we riot? Why does it go to that particular angle? And I think I came to a decent understanding of that. Um, but I think there's more to analyze around all that with these particular instances. Um, and certainly more to talk about in terms of moving forward from from all this. So I hope that you guys will help me have a good conversation down there in the comments. I'd like to give a special thank you to Tressa for supporting the channel through PayPal. If you'd like to support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com. We always limit our commercials and many times have to go without commercials to properly discuss these issues and cases. So I really appreciate your support. Take care, everyone, and I'll be back on Labor Day with a new case cracked right here on the Lord and Arts channel.